We're back, and you're listening to Executive Leaders Radio, broadcast from the Fairfax County Chamber of Commerce. This is your host, Mike Mannion, with Sirius Interim Executive Solutions. I'm joined by my co-host, Joe Applebaum, of the Potomac Companies, and we are really excited to introduce to you our final guest of the day. His name is John Marks. John is the founder and president of Search for Common Ground. So, John, welcome to the show, and tell us, what is Search for Common Ground? Search for Common Ground is a nonprofit. Um, we're the largest uh, nonprofit or NGO working in the field of conflict resolution around the world. Um, we have offices in uh, 30 countries and about 425 employees. Can you give us an example of the work you do? Uh, we try to uh, end violence. We try to prevent it. Um, we do everything from a lot of TV pr- production. We make soap opera in 17 countries. Uh, we do uh, round tables. We bring people together from across political divides. Um, we work with youth. We work with young people. But it's all within the context of understanding the differences and acting on the commonalities. Wow. And you've been doing this again for how long? I founded the organization 30 years ago. And you've got 425 people doing this with you? Yes. Wow. Uh, back 30 years ago, um, you had a vision. What, what, what was the vision? The vision was that the world needed to find better ways of dealing with conflict and that if you could resolve conflict uh, in a win-win fashion, in a non-adversarial fashion, it would be a lot more productive and a lot more beneficial than trying to do it through dominance or win-lose kind of methodologies. What was happening in the world at that time? Well, at that point, the Cold War was raging. Um, There was a feeling that the world might blow itself up. The U.S. and the Soviets were facing each other as the enemy. And we said, and it wasn't a popular idea at the time, that the world would be much better off if they stood together and took on ending the threat as a shared problem. That's remarkable work. This vision that you had, um, did that start in childhood? I always was interested in international affairs and foreign policy. In fact, my first job at 22 is I went into the Foreign Service. And so I was interested. I didn't have this consciousness at that point. Um, I was just a person who I kind of came in on the tail end of the Kennedy idea of ask now what you can do for your country. Um, Ask now what you can do. In other words, That's not <laughs> to, what you can do, do what you can for your country. I've got the, the quotes wrong. But the Kennedy idealism that you could be committed, and that, that was driving me. But I didn't have the ideas that became the essence of Search for Common Ground until I got up into my 30s. Yeah. Well, what role did your father or your mother play in, in your desire to create this organization to help conflict resolution? Yeah. My father was a highly successful entrepreneur. He built the largest insurance agency in America, and he had had to drop out of school during the Depression um, to support his parents. And I inherited, I believe, his entrepreneurial skills, but luckily for me, I grew up a middle-class kid, perhaps an upper-middle-class kid, and I didn't have to make those kinds of financial sacrifices, if you will. But I had the talents from my father, and I think I inherited that more than anything else from him. Yeah. Uh, Yet you said that going into the Foreign Service was an act of rebellion. How so? My father wanted me to go into his insurance business. He wanted me to be his son and his partner. And a lot of it was his self-preservation in the sense because he knew when he was 65, if he didn't have a relative as a partner, he would become redundant in the field. And he wanted me very much to do it because he wanted what had came a lot, what he had built to stay in the family, and he wanted to be able to keep working. And um, I wasn't interested, frankly. I wanted to go out and see the world and change it. Was it difficult to tell your dad that? We fought about it probably for about <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> and when I started Search for Common Ground, he said, you can't afford to do this. You should go out and get a job. To tell us a bit about the zeitgeist, if you will, of the times back uh, during the early Kennedy administration and, and personalize it. How did you feel back then? I felt that there was something beyond life to selling insurance or selling razor blades and that I wanted to be engaged in the world. I wanted to do something meaningful with my life. That was what was driving me all those years. Well, now that you've uh, created this uh, wonderful organization, could you tell us uh, your most meaningful work? I know there's many 
but you told us in the green room that there was one specific um, with regard to Rwanda. Well, I, I would like to put on the top of that list what we were been able to accomplish in Burundi. Burundi was on the brink of genocide, just as Rwanda, which is next door with the same ethnic mix, had had a genocide. And we went in in 1995, and it lasted for our involvement very seriously for about the next five or six years. And I think we played a profound part in keeping the country from going over the brink and winding up as Rwanda had wound up in a genocidal situation. Would you take us behind the scenes? Um, and y y you're in a room with, with people, leaders of organizations that on some level are embittered towards one another. W w what do you do? Well, one thing we perceived, one of the big problems in Rwanda had been that um, uh, the radio, it was called hate radio. and uh, Hate radio. Hate radio. And it had been encouraging people to kill each other. In other words, it had been a, a tool in ethnic warfare. And we decided that we would start something to counter hate radio. Well, the opposite of hate radio is not love radio. But we set up a radio which was sort of common ground radio, which brought people together from the two sides. We did um, everything from a lot of soap opera to the news to music. Uh, we had cultural programming. At the peak, we were doing 15 hours a week of broadcasting with both Hutu and Tutsi journalists and reporters. They were the ethnic groups. And the, it, the uh, whole thing of it was bringing those people into a meaningful media re um, um, relationship and having the radio reflect their common ground, not their differences. When you show up in a country, are you welcomed by people saying, oh, we're so glad you're here to help us resolve our differences, or is it back off and get out? Usually we can find people who will welcome us. <laughs> in other words, it's not universal. We Sometimes we go in at an invitation, or sometimes we create our local partners. But there's always somebody in the country who thinks this is a good idea. Yeah. At least. But, uh, are there situations, or, or tell us about one situation where it, it could have gone either way? It, it was on the brink of maybe just completely dissolving and, and something terrible happening? Well, it happened to us in Angola. Angola we went into because we thought the Civil War was coming to an end, and we went in, and within about a year or two, the, the Civil War got worse than ever. It became almost impossible to move, and many of the NGOs, non-governmental organizations, were pulling out. But we had a perception that we probably should stay, because if we don't stay when the times are tough, when they, as they improve, you know, there's no, we're, there, we're going to not have a role. So when you say stay, you lived in Angola for two years. Well, I didn't. I had five. I had employees who lived in Angola. I live in Washington, D.C., okay. but the only place, uh, I, my, after 9-11, my wife and I, I work with my wife. Yes. She's a senior vice president. Yes. The two of us decided that Jerusalem was the center of the conflict in the world, or the biggest conflict in the world, and we moved to Jerusalem for two years after 9-11, and we ran both the Jerusalem office and the organization, which was made possible by the seven-hour time difference. In other words, we, <laughs> we ran Jerusalem during the day and the whole organization <laughs> during the night. Have you ever felt personally threatened? Sure. Give uh, us an example. Well, I've been, in situa I've been in situations where people are shooting at each other. Um, I remember once in, in um, crossing from the Israeli side to the Palestinian side, and there was tear gas shooting a, up above, and there were soldiers shooting other people, and it wasn't, it wasn't fun. Nobody was shooting at me, but in a situation like that, you can sometimes get in the way. So why did you not just say, <laughs> you know what, enough is enough, and I'm out of here. I'm, I'm going to save my own skin. Well, I, I, don't take, I don't take risks that are stupid, but this is what I do. And that was, the, you know, I, 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 would, I crossed and I got out of the way, and that's what I do. Does that mean you know no fear, or you just deal with the fear and press on? Yeah, it's, it's, this is my job. This is what I do. And I... I'm not fearless. I've had the bejesus scared out of me. But for the most part, I avoid that. And usually when you're on the ground in the middle of something, it's much less fear-inducing fear than reading about it in the newspaper. I was in Libya about four months ago. I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. You said it's much less fear-inducing? 
Yeah, in, in other, other words, being there is not usually there are people going along. I, I said I was in Libya about four months ago, and Libya is a place that if you read the newspapers, you get scared. There's supposed to be a lot of militia yeah. activity. Well, I ran into a lot of traffic jams, and there were people who were going about their business. And usually when you're in a place, I'm not saying there isn't violence, but it usually is not something that you have a sense of unless you're absolutely in the middle of it. The most meaningful contribution you would like to make moving forward before you, you leave this earth is what? <laughs> I'd like to change the way the world deals with conflict. I'd like to become a global figure. I'd like the ideas that I have to take on a huge currency so they, they run the way governments and individuals interact with each other. Would you give us the web address for Search for Common Ground, please? It's www.sfcg.org. In other words, search for common ground, www.sfcg.org. Thank you very much. We've been speaking with John Marks. John is the founder and president of Search for Common Ground. I'd like to thank all of our guests today, including Sadakar Shinoy, founder, CEO, and chairman of In Information Management Consultants, or IMC, Steve Biondi, president North America of Microfocus, Nicole Geller, founder and CEO of GCS, and of course, most recently, John Marks, founder and president of Search for Common Ground.